I'm going to read the gospel this morning because there's some tricky, tricky words in it. So my volunteers sort of said, hey, why don't you read? All right. This is the gospel of Luke chapter three, beginning with the first verse. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ateria and Trachonitis and Lysanias tetrarch of Abilene during the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of the Lord came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare a way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and every crooked and, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do, not, uh, and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowd asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share it with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers asked him, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, I need a water after that one. Mm. Mm. Well, it's unavoidable now. The Christmas season is in full effect. The lights are out. The trees are up. The ornaments are on. You can see it here. There was a group here uh, yesterday who had a great time setting everything up. It looks so beautiful. Um, it's Christmas season for sure. Definitely. A lot goes into Christmas. It seems that everyone contributes or participates in the putting together of Christmas. Every family member has their role, I believe. I have a lesser role than most, I think, in my household. But everybody kind of does their share. Christmas doesn't just arrive. Christmas is put together over weeks. You go and you buy a tree. And that's an ordeal, isn't it? Going to buy a tree, that's something else. When you go there and you kind of select, what is the criteria for picking a tree? What is the, I mean, what, everyone has their own shape, I guess, and their own sort of, you know, how tall it should be or whatever. And I don't know what it is about trees, but when you see the tree you want, you just know it's yours, right? You come to it and you're like, yeah, that's the one, right? And they come to clip the thing, they're not that one, this one, this is the one. Can't you tell this is the best one? Right, and, you, and they take it and they strap it to your car and they put it in that like net bag or that's really hard to remove when you get home, right? And as you're watching them do all this stuff, you look at other people and you can't understand why they pick the trees that they pick, right? They're looking at it just like, what in the world? Why would you pick that tree? There's so many holes and it's all crooked. 
But people just kind of have their tree. They know what they like, and they just get it. In my family, we also do this other thing. Notice there's these nice white lights on the, the, uh, the trees here. My family waits till the last minute to buy lights, and we always end up with blue lights because those are the ones that are left. I remember we lived on your street, Ray. When we lived on, you thought we were Jewish. It's like, why do you have Jewish lights? You guys are crazy. It's crazy. But anyway, um, we kind of uh, get ready for Christmas. A lot goes into Christmas. Christmas just doesn't arrive. It just doesn't grow on trees. Christmas is assembled. It's put together. It, it, there's a preparation period called Advent in order to get ready for Christmas. And everyone participates even the non-church goer, even the people that are outside the faith, they're doing it too. They get excited about preparing for Christmas. Why? Does anybody know why? I mean, I know I always do that in a sermon. I always ask why. I'm like the kid that always asks why. But I really am curious. Why do people outside of the faith that aren't Jesus followers or aren't Jesus fans, why do they put so much time and energy preparing for Christmas? I mean, if you go around the neighborhoods, you see these houses with like lights everywhere. It must have taken hours and, you know, maybe a couple thousand dollars worth of stuff in the lawn and all that. And you can see it from space, right? But, you know, and there's so much that goes into it. Why do we do that? What is that about? Why are these people so all in? John the Baptist asked the people, um, like the tax collectors that you just heard, and the sinners to get their house in order. That Jesus was about to arrive, and you better get your house in order. He actually was talking about Jesus' adult ministry. Jesus was about to come and, and start his ministry. And he was warning people, he's coming. Get ready. Be prepared for him. But it also applies to Jesus arriving at his birth in the beginning at Christmas. Be prepared. Don't get caught off guard. Be ready for the arrival of the Spirit of God in your life. This is an interesting concept to me. Be ready. Be prepared. What does that mean? We say we want to be better people. We say we want a, a better world. We say we want love to rule. But we're so wrapped up and committed to behaviors and people and environments that are in total contradiction to those goals. We're not ready to meet Jesus. So many Christians, if they're really honest and they take a serious inventory of their life, they would say the same thing. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I'm ready to be face to face with Jesus. Oh, it's a good exercise. You should try it sometime when you're alone and you're just kind of thinking and bored. Do this. What if Jesus was flying into Dulles Airport in two weeks, right? Not this Friday, not next Friday, but the next Friday after that, which is a very special Friday. I hope you'll be there that night. What would you need to do to be ready for Jesus' arrival? I mean, if he really was coming the Friday after the Friday after the next Friday, if he was really coming on that day, what would you need to do? Think about that. I mean, there's relatives who come and visit us and we prepare things. But think if Jesus were to come, what would you do? I know what I would say if that was happening to me. I would say I need more time. I'm not ready. I need more time to take a fearless moral inventory 
I need to get my spiritual house in order. This is what John is saying to those people. He says to the tax collectors, don't cheat people. It does you no good to ask for forgiveness and grace if you then turn around and cheat people the very next moment. What good is it? He says to the soldiers, you want to turn things around in your life, but then you go right back to the person you were before. What good is that? If you want to live a life with Christ, if you truly want to grow and mature in your faith, you have to at least think about and value going all the way. We talk about being all in. We talked about it last week. The poker analogy, because I didn't have enough time to think of a better one. But putting all in. And this week we're talking about going all the way. Advent is very similar to Lent. You notice uh, they're both purple. Sometimes we change it to blue or whatever, but in the old church, it was purple. And it's a, it's a color that symbolizes anticipation. Something is coming. And in Advent, Christmas is coming. And in Lent, Easter is coming. In the Lent season, we prepare for death. We think about our life and what it would mean to die and be raised. And so we give up the things during Lent that are keeping us from our relationship with God. That's what giving up things in Lent is all about. Well, Advent is very similar. We're anticipating the coming of Christ. There's a lot of second coming passages early on. And we anticipate Christ coming into our lives and starting a new year on the eighth day of Christmas. And eight being a uh, a number, a symbol of rebirth and kind of a renewal, right? You have seven days of the week and the eighth day is the new week. So on the eighth day of Christmas is the new year. It's kind of like preparing for the new year with Christ. And that's what it's about. It's not just a time to see lights on your house and lights on your trees inside. It's a time to let your light so shine before others that they may see Christ in you. That's what Christmas is about. It's a time to let the light of Christ dwell within you. That's what we see in the incarnation. Everyone gets freaked out when church people talk about virgin birth, right? Oh, it's impossible. Can never be born of a virgin. But the whole entire picture of that is that God intentionally came to dwell among us by God's own decision. And we see Christ dwell within us, his light, his word, all of it. The Christmas spirit is about going all the way. It's about having that great light in you that you can see from space. I know that's the corniest line in this whole sermon. But I want you to remember this. So I left it in there. I said, I should take that out. But you're going to remember it. The light in you that you can see from space. Because it is our Lord who lives and dwells within us. Who is our strength and our guide. And it is time for us in this season to go all the way. Jesus made it possible for us to go all the way in him. 
He gave us the supper so that we would be reminded every week that He dwells within us. His word, His grace, His love dwells within us. That is a constant reminder. So let's receive the means of grace this morning. And go out into the world and be lights. Shining brightly that gift of Christmas and that spirit. Amen?